Oder? The hell are you watching? Oh, it's one of my favorites. Here, I'll start it over for you. I don't worry about it, bro. So you got any movies from this century? Come on, give it a chance, B. Dad's on his way back, and uh, I think we're gonna eat soon anyway. All right, how about after we eat then? Nah, there's somewhere I gotta be after we eat. So important that you're gonna leave Sunday dinner. Got a card game in the neighborhood. I gotta be at. Game in the neighborhood, huh? If there ain't nowhere in the neighborhood you gotta be at. I'll play a quick one before I gotta go. Nah, I don't play poker no more, Bert. Come on, Mace. It's just a game. Just one. I don't care if it's for nothing. For a thousand a hand, Bert. I don't play poker no more, man. Older brother can't give me a tip? You think you know about poker, huh? Yeah. All right, hot shot. I give you a poker tip. Give me the cards. What are you doing? You ain't got a deal? You want a poker tip, huh? Yeah. All right, I'll give you one. I used to play in the neighborhood all the time. I wasn't much older than you. Actually, I was probably about the same age. After you and moms moved out, me and Pop had to put some extra dough together. So I started collecting money for a guy named Paulie and his father. They were a couple of bookies. And they used to have a kid named Georgie, who was partial to, always running the numbers for him, kind of like their guinea pig. Yo. Mace. Dude, beat it. It's all there, bro. Might you count? Uh, no. Come on, George, you know these people. The stupidest people on earth. I let them leave a message on my telephone, and next thing you know, they owe me a thousand dollars. You wanna know why? Why? Because they're stupid. <laughs> Try not to lose it all back to me, man. I don't understand you, man. Don't bet on sports, but you'll play poker. It's not just the cards. You can also play the man. Yeah, we'll, we'll see about that tonight, huh? Six o'clock, huh? You know it. Same bad time, same bad channel. Alright, man, peace. Peace. Hey, yo, Polly. Yeah. Hey, it's Mason. Do me a favor, let your pop know I'll be by tomorrow to see him. You know he ain't gonna be back until tomorrow afternoon, why? Well, yeah, I know, but just tell him if he has him. He could be at the game tonight, right? Just bring it, and I'll hold it for you. Nah, man, like I said, when he comes back tomorrow, I'll give it to him myself. You're still coming to the game, right? Yeah, I'm coming. Would it be a game if I wasn't? Remember now. Since it was over by me, it's house rules tonight. Yeah, yeah, I know. House rules, table stakes, no limit. I just don't like what's happening to what started out a few years ago as a friendly game between neighbors. You can't handle it? I ain't saying that. I'm just saying that that no limit stuff of yours is brutal. It's a fair game. What are you trying to say, Mason? No, I'm not saying the game ain't fair, man. I'm just saying that your bankroll gives you a considerable advantage over any of the boys if they ever wanted to hedge a bet. If you can't afford it, then don't play. Yeah, I wouldn't play if I couldn't afford it. So I'll see you around six then. Yeah, yeah. The boys who were regulars at the neighborhood game were few, but nonetheless common faces who had lived out their childhood among us. Gentlemen, what's going on? What's the case door? Where's George at? Yeah, we sent him off for some sandwiches. <laughs> sandwiches. <laughs> for instance, Donnie. Now, Donnie had spent most of his childhood growing up with us in the neighborhood, and he was the only college grad of the group. He had even finished law school. Although he had the money, Donald never was much of a risk taker, which didn't make him much of a great poker player either. All the same, he could afford to lose more than he ever did, 
And when he walked out down a few bucks, he was the kind of guy who can consider it a worthwhile investment just to spend some time with the boys. And there was Frankie. Now, to keep it short and sweet, you could say he was a man of many words, although you could sum him up with a few. He had lived his whole life in the neighborhood and wouldn't have it any different if he could. After high school, he got a job working on the docks for the union and was proud to be average. He had a story for every and any occasion, and he never hesitated to tell it. However, when it came to backing his mouth up on the poker table, he never was one to lose more than he could put in the middle. And we all knew it, because he never put nothing in the middle. Now, Georgie's story was a little bit different. He was Paulie's lackey and my neighbor for as long as I could remember, and he was more than a few years younger than the rest of us. You could almost say he was like a kid brother. When we were kids, he always tried to tag along with Paulie and me. No matter how bad we used to bust his balls, he took it like a man and stuck around. We respected his toughness, and before we could legally order a drink in a bar, he was running numbers and collecting money owed to the book. Georgie, he'd never miss a game, and never had won one either. His aggressive rookie playing style was more dangerous than the others, but when it came to bluffing, he was soft as puppy shit. Then there was Paulie. Like I'd mentioned before, Paulie and his father were bookies who would run numbers for the local degenerates who had bet on sports. Ever since I can remember, Paulie was always leaning on somebody for money. And when Paulie was leaning on you, you felt it. Me and Paulie were pretty close for a while until the day inevitably came that what I had given him to give to his father had come up short. When I had explained my story to his dad and he had explained his, his father ended up taking my side over his own son's. Ever since, I felt the distance between us, and I couldn't tell you why, and I can still only guess that Paulie had skimmed from the collection and somehow felt I had ratted him out. Well, from then on, I always felt that Paulie would jump at the chance to get even with me. All right, about 100. I assume you ain't got nothing, and uh, there's no rules saying that you gotta tell us what you got every time, you know? Let the boy play, Paulie. It's not like you're not gonna raise him out of his blinds or anything. Yeah, hey, I just wanna help the kid out, you know? I wanna make sure he calls his hand right, that's all. Play the game right, you know? <laughs> Deal, Frankie. All right, well, bet 200. Call 200. I'm out. All right, uh, bet 300. Here, you give that to the janitor. What, Mason? Yeah. You get a new bankroll, come on back. Night is young. Yeah, the cards are terrible. I'd lost about a thousand dollars. Well, even though I'd been beat, See, it was the way I was beat that really bothered me. The more I thought about it, the more I convinced myself that I could beat Paulie if I only had a new bankroll. So I headed back home. I did have money in a savings account, about $9,000. It was too late to go to the bank, and I had to get back into that game. After all, I had borrowed money out of the collections before, and I'd always put it back. I had a perfect record. Never once was I short. So if I lost what I took, I would just go to the bank in the morning, take out whatever I was short, see if I didn't win, of course, 
and would replace it before I made the drop. See, back then, a couple of dimes was easy money to put together. And like I said, I had it covered, because I had money in the bank. Bert, I wasn't the least bit worried. At the time, I had the money to cover it. And for a minute, I was actually kind of excited knowing the fact that I'd use Paulie's money to get back some of mine. <laughs> you can guess what happened then. You lost? In less than an hour. You couldn't have believed the bad run of luck I had. Every time I got half a hand, Paulie would. You know, bet enough that I got scared. I could never win playing with scared money. So, I left that time again a loser. But humbled with a sense of relief, knowing that I would transfer the money go to the bank in the morning, take it out, and make good on my job. So what, you just went home and chalked it up a lot? Not quite. See, I went home and I tried to transfer the money. I went on the computer, something came up about the servers or some computer mumbo jumbo, and I had to wait till Monday and go to the bank myself. I couldn't wait till Monday and go to the bank. I knew I needed the money the next day. I had already seen Paulie, and it was a sure bet that after I had called him, he told his father that I had collected the money. And even if he hadn't told him yet, he was sure to tell him about beating me out of the five grand at the game the night before. See, I'd never been short in the past. Even though I had history with Paulie's dad, I knew it would be a perfect opportunity for Paulie to get back at me, especially because it was him who cleaned me out of the money I owed. I could already feel the smirk on Paulie's face. I'd have to break it to his father that I'd messed up. Since I was already two bottles of whiskey and five grand in, I figured, what does it matter how much I'm screwed for now? Five grand, 10 grand? It's all the same when you're dealing with people like Paulie and his dad. So I took the other $6,000 and decided it was sink or swim and headed back to the game. Deal me in. What are you gonna use for money? $6,000. What, this is your money? Hmm? I brought it here. I put it on the table. I guess that pretty much makes it mine. Well, I hope so, because uh, when I win it all, I guarantee I'm not gonna give any of it back, man. You know, that's for sure. Just deal the cards. There it was. He laid it all out for me right then and there. If I didn't come up with his father's money the next morning, he'd prove me a thief and make sure he'd let him know about the game the night before. Did you still play? Haven't you been listening? My whole life depended on that money, and so it began. There wasn't the usual ball busting that was common at the table. No one spoke unless it was to make or call a bet. The play went on for hours. Now when I play recklessly, I do pretty good. But when I started thinking about Paulie's dad and my situation, I would back off and begin to lose. But then it came, the hand I was waiting for, the hand that would save me. Queen's bet. Mason, uh, I'll raise you five. Fifteen hundred. See your raise. And 
bump you. 2,000. Hey, uh, wait a minute, Mason. You know I got four tenths. I don't know anything of the kind, Polly. I think you've got three tens and a fat bankroll, and you're trying to steal this pot the way you've been stealing pots for the last six months. Oh, well, 2,000 and I'll raise it to you, man. Table stakes. No house rules. House rules? What, you can get some more money? Will you take a check? Oh, sure. Don't be a fool. Mason ain't got that kind of money. Nah, he ain't gonna try to write a bad check. Uh, you go to jail for something like that. I see you're 2,000. Starting to look like you got four queens. It'll cost you exactly three thousand dollars to see my whole card. It wasn't a queen. It was a jack. The jack of clubs, to be exact. And we all know that four tens beats three queens. All he had four tens? He had them all right. My hand was a ship taking water. All I could do was wait for Paulie to add the last drop that would send me to the bottom of the sea. And in the position I was in, the bottom of the sea sounded real good. <sighs> well, looks like you got him. I gotta see that. It's a jack. He stole the pot. Let me see those. Bet that's not the only thing you stole tonight. I guess you'll never know, Paulie. I guess you'll never know. Hey, boys, let's see. I know you gotta be somewhere. Ah, don't worry about it, Pop. I think I'm gonna stick around here tonight. <laughs> 